morning, everyone, and Jason, thanks very much for asking me to give this, this first talk. The, um, the RAMC is justifiably proud of the fact that 31 Victoria Crosses have been awarded to the Army Medical Services since the inception of the VC in 1856. Now, I say 31, but these 31 B VCs have been awarded to 29 individuals. So it doesn't really take um, too much uh, of, of math to work out that if 29 individuals have been awarded 31 VCs, somebody must have been awarded two. And, and in fact, two doctors have been awarded the VC twice. And, and that itself is something that, that is quite extraordinary because that has only ever happened on three occasions. And it's these two doctors that I want to talk about tonight. As you can see, Arthur Martin Leake and Noel Chavas. And so let's start with the first awardee, Arthur Martin Leake. Um, I, am, I am not, a, oh, there we are, good. So Arthur Martin Leake was um, born in Marshalls. Um, there it is at High Cross in Hertfordshire. It's the same house that he would actually die in almost 80 years later. Um, and this, in fact, this photograph, I, I should say that Marie Ellis and myself went up to check on the, his, um, his memorial in the churchyard and we saw that the house had got a load of builders in it. So we thought we'd nip down there and see if we could get a look inside. And in fact, the owner was there and she invited us in and let us have a look. And it was her plan to actually restore it as much as she could to its original condition. And so this is the actual, the, the rear of, um, of Marshall's. So this is where Martin Leake was born. He had five brothers and two sisters and all the boys, all his brothers and himself loved the outdoor life around High Cross in Hertfordshire and they all learned to ride. He then went at age 14 to Westminster School. He excelled in science and so he looked towards medicine as a career. He then entered University College Hospital in 1893, age 19. And here again, he excelled um, and, and he was awarded quite a few prizes during his medical studies. One of the disciplines that he didn't do well in was midwifery. And Throughout his life, as we all hear, he never really got on well with women. He qualified as a doctor in October 1898. And after initial appointments at University College Hospital and the Surrey County Lunatic Asylum at Brookwood, he was appointed as house surgeon at Hertfordshire Infirmary in Hemel Hempstead in October 1899. Now, on the outbreak of the South African War, he requested a leave of absence from the hospital and he joined the Hertfordshire Company of the Imperial Yeomanry. He was impatient to get to the war, so he enlisted as a trooper, hoping that sometime in the future, the position of a medical officer would become available. And in anticipation of this, he took his medical, his instrument set out with him to South Africa. He landed in South Africa on the 28th of May 1900 and by October he had secured himself a position as a civil surgeon attached to the REMC. Now he became quite disgruntled with the REMC and he, when he was offered a commission in the REMC he refused it and then shortly after he requested to be released from his contract to come back home to England and as he was about to leave he saw that Major General Baden-Powell was forming a new force called the South African Constabulary and that doctors were required. So on the 24th of May 1900, he joined this new force, but immediately he was not happy that it employed female nurses in its hospital. There he is as a, as a surgeon captain in the South African Constabulary. Um, you can see that it's, it's not his initial employment because he's wearing his Victoria Cross there. But it's interesting that those, um, those, the embroidery on his cuffs is green. The facing colours of the South African Constabulary were green. 
So let's go to the 8th of February 1902 then, when Arthur Martin Leake accompanied 150 men of the South African Constabulary into the Veldt. The force encountered a party of Boers and during the fighting several South African Constabulary were wounded, including Arthur himself, who went out to treat them. He was hit in the hand and the thigh and as the rest of the South African Constabulary contingent withdrew, they had to leave their wounded behind. So he stayed with them and treated them for several hours, despite his own wounds. And finally, the wounded were evacuated, they were rescued, they were, they were evacuated to the South African Constabulary Hospital at Heidelberg. His wounds were treated, they healed quickly, but unfortunately he sustained damage to his ulnar nerve and a, re a medical board recommended that he's sent back to England for six months. And on the 3rd of March, uh, Baden-Powell sent a recommendation to Kitchener for the award of a Victoria Cross to Arthur Martin Lee, but Kitchener and Lord Roberts both thought that this act of bravery did not warrant a VC and they recommended that a distinguished service order be, and they sent the recommendation back to the Secretary of War who disagreed and he put it before the King and the King approved the award of the VC on the 8th of May. And the citation reads, Vlack Fontaine, South Africa, 8th of February, 1902. For great devotion to duty and self-sacrifice at Vlackfontein on the 8th of February 1902, when he went out into the firing line to dress a wounded man under very heavy fire from about 40 Boers, only 100 yards off. When he had done all he could for him, he went over to a badly wounded officer and while trying to place him on a more comfortable position, he was shot about three times. He only gave up when thoroughly exhausted and then he refused water until other wounded men had been served. Now the Victoria Cross itself was presented by the King on the 2nd of June and afterwards he had further surgery on his hand performed by Victor Horsley and while recovering he passed his exams for a fellowship of the Royal College of Surgeons. But he was quite concerned now that, that, that because of this this wound to its own and nerve that perhaps and, and he, he also had for further surgery on it but he p thought that perhaps the life of a surgeon was not going to be for him but his brothers who were working out in India on the Bengal Nagpur railway they persuaded him to join them in India and serve on the railway as a doctor but as part of the contract to serve on the Bengal Nagpur railway he had to join the Bengal Nagpur Railway Volunteer Corps. Now I want to just digress slightly and take you to Aldershot Military Cemetery to this grave, the Caulfield grave. One of Arthur's brothers, Theo, joined the Royal Engineers and he was a balloonist. And on the 28th of May, 1907, in the presence of the King, along with this chap, Lieutenant Caulfield Royal Engineers, they took off from just a couple of miles away from where I am, from Farnborough, in the balloon Thrasher. But on the 29th of May, nothing had been heard. And on the 30th of May, a fisherman off the, in the sea off Exmouth had found a balloon floating there, but no bodies. And it would be until June before they suddenly, they, they eventually recall um, recovered these two bodies. So th although uh, Martin Leake's brother is not buried here, this, this is his um, companion from the balloon that um, crashed in the sea. Now in 1912, Martin Leake was home on leave from India and the Balkan War broke out and it was described as one of the fiercest seen in Europe for many years. And with mounting casualties, Greece made an appeal to England for help and the British Red Cross decided to raise volunteer units to help. Three teams were needed, so Arthur Martin Leake immediately volunteered to help and he was one of the first units to depart for Montenegro on the 20th of October 1912. And he eventually arrived there on the 26th of October. 
he um, was very keen to get close to the fighting. He didn't want to be left behind in a hospital. He wanted to go forward. Um, and there you can see him on the right of that photograph on the right hand side. Arthur eventually returned home in May 1913, <clears throat> excuse me, and a month later went back to India. He was awarded the Montenegro Order of the Red Cross and the British Red Cross Special War Medal. But by the time the latter was going to be presented, he had already gone back to India, so it had to be posted out to him. With the outbreak of the First World War on the 5th of August, he volunteered again to serve and he caught a boat from India to Marseille and travelled to Paris, where he arrived on the 29th of August 1914. And um, remarkably, for some reason, he was able to join the REMC in Paris. He didn't have to come back to, to England. They granted him a commission and he was assigned to to the field ambulance, number five field ambulance, which is a unit that I eventually served in in 1988 um, when I was first commissioned. He joined them southwest of Paris on the 6th of September and they went on to see action on the Ain. Between the 21st and 24th of October, they moved to the Ypres sector and were in action at Langemark and then the unit split in two between Ypres and Vlamertingi. Um, any of you that have ever been to that wonderful museum, uh, the Passchendaele Museum at Zonnebeek, where you park your cars, um, or if you're in a coach, where you park your coach, the area that that um, Arthur was in action is just slightly up that, um, that road into the countryside on the right-hand side um, from the car park. He took his section and installed um, an advanced dressing station in the White House at Zonnebeek. And this location was subject to heavy shelling continuously. And he itself, the White House, was hit on the 12th of November. So uh, again, if you've been to that museum, you'll recognize the lake. And just slightly to the left of it, the building is the old chateau, which has the museum in it. Um, during this period, he was constantly out in the front rescuing wounded. And on the 20th of February, whilst home on leave, he was informed that his name would appear in the London Gazette. Now, being very modest, he thought, well, I'm going to get a mention in dispatches. But how wrong he was, but because the announcement was the award of a bar, so a second Victoria Cross to him. For most conspicuous bravery and devotion to duty throughout the campaign, especially during the period 29 October to 3rd November 1914 near Zonabate, in rescuing, whilst exposed to constant fire, a large number of the wounded who were lying close to the enemy's trenches. So that's, that's his citation. Now there's a problem. This is the first time that a bar had been awarded to a Victoria Cross. So there's some confusion how they were going to signify this award. And these, um, these three documents from the National Archives, you can see on, on Hancock's note paper, were various designs that were put forward, whether it should be a bar with a wreath, whether it's just a bar, um, and how they were gonna signify a second award. Um, the other problem, was that Arthur's Victoria Cross was in India. So he had to get his brothers, to, or one of his brothers, to post it from India to him back in the United Kingdom. And this is how they eventually signified the award, second award. So the bar you can see fixed on the, on the obverse on the left, and then the reverse on the original cross has his surgeon captain South African constabulary on the the suspension and the date on the cross itself and then the subsequent award all the details are um, engraved on the bar. So what happened to to him after the uh, for the rest of the war? Well on the 19th of March 1917 he was appointed CO of 46 field ambulance 
um, located in the area of Arras. And uh, he, he very often used to put a sign up saying number one Harley Street outside his, um, his advanced dressing station. He moved to the Eep Salient in June 1917 and its headquarters was at Brandhook. And at the end of July, early August 1917, the 55th Division main dressing station was at Red Farm, close to Brandhook Crossroads. And Arthur's head unit headquarters was on the other side of the road. Now this is um, an important point and I would ask you just to remember that Arthur's headquarters is close to Brandhook Crossroads. Now in September 17, the field ambulance moved back to Arras and in June 18, he was appointed CO of 42 casualty clearing stations southwest of Arras at Bac du Sud. But on the 23rd of September 1918, his contract has expired, so he didn't extend it. Extend it. He decided it was time to go back home um, and retire from the army. He went back to India and he met Winifred Carroll, a 45-year-old widow. They returned briefly to England to be married at Westminster on the 1st of October 1930, but the marriage did not last because on the 14th of October 1932, whilst on a train tour of the central provinces, his wife committed suicide and was buried the same day. So in 1937, Martin Leake left India for the final time. During the Second World War, he served in the ARP, but he was not to live much longer after the end of the war. On the 23rd of June, 1953, he was found in a pool of blood on the bathroom floor at Marshall's, and he died soon after. After cremation, his ashes were buried in the churchyard at High Cross. And th this is the churchyard that quite a few of us are familiar with. Just um, as a point, that um, that dog, uh, when, when um, he died, his medals and that dog were left to the REMC. Um, the dog, obviously still alive, was left to the guard room at the REMC depot at, at um, Queen Elizabeth Barracks, Crookham. Now, when, um, the Gurkhas finally moved out of Queen Elizabeth Barracks and they were going to demolish it. I did go over there wondering if I could find a headstone for his dog, but unfortunately there, there were some other um, dogs' headstones, but not Martin Leake's. And these are his medals on display in the museum. Uh, his, his, obviously his Victoria Cross, his two South African War medals, his First World War medals. Um, and there's only one of his Balkan War medals on display although the museum when I took this photograph they have got the second one and his um, Indian forces decoration his territorial decoration for his service on the Bengal Nagpur Railway Volunteer Corps. There's lots of other things in the museum that belong to him there is um, a wonderful set of cutlery there is a uniform jacket pistol holster all sorts of things and it's really worth going and having a look at. So he's the first one. Now, the second one is um, this chap, Noel Godfrey Chavas. He was born one of twins on the 9th of November, 1884 at Oxford to the Reverend Francis Chavas and his wife, Edith. Christopher says he was the eldest by 20 minutes. At that time, his father was the rector of St. Peter Le Bailey in Oxford, and as such, they lived in 36 New Inn Hall Street, if any of you know Oxford at all. Initially, he was tutored at home, but aged 12, both of the twins went, to, went as day pupils to Magdalen College School in Oxford. And they both showed quite, um, that they showed excellent, excellence in athletics. In March 1900, their father was offered the position of Bishop of Liverpool so, and he was consecrated there on the 25th of April 1900. So the family had to then up sticks and move to Abercrombie Square. And we'll, we'll see a bit more about that at the end of this piece about um, Chavas. They went to Liverpool College 
and again excelled in sport, but time was fast approaching to look to what they were going to do um, at university. Trinity at Oxford was chosen. Noel wanted to study medicine, but Christopher wanted to enter the church. Now, whilst at Trinity, they were awarded Oxford Blues for running. Um, and at the same time, despite all this athletics, Noel gained a first in, in physiology. But in the summer of 1908, it was the London Olympics. And it took uh, both twins were entered for the 400 meters heats. That's how good they were. But sadly, they were both knocked out. So they didn't actually race in the final. And while at Oxford for Noel, a uniform beckoned. He joined the OTC in January 1909. But in, in July 1909, he left Oxford for Liverpool and in October entered the University of Liverpool Medical School to begin his studies. He passed his finals and he registered with the General Medical Council in 1912 and he wanted to go into orthopaedics. And on the 4th of October 1912, he was appointed house surgeon at the Royal Southern Hospital. And this uniform was beckoning again. And in 1913, he joined the 10th Battalion, the King's, Liverpool Regiment, Liverpool Scots, as a surgeon lieutenant. He went off to camp with them between the 2nd and the 16th of August 1914. So he was away at camp as war broke out. At the same time, Christopher, his brother, was accepted as a temporary chaplain fourth class in the army. And on the 8th of August, Noel was sent to Chester Castle to examine recruits, which he wasn't too happy about because he thought, I, I, I don't want to miss out if the battalion is mobilised and goes off to war. But they were in Edinburgh. The battalion was in Edinburgh and that's where he rejoined them in September. But he learned to ride while he was there. But the, the other thing about Noel, he did something he was very keen on, is he trained his stretcher bearers in first aid. He was very keen on making sure that his stretcher bearers were the best that there is. And this is a, a photograph of him sitting with some of his stretcher bearers. Eventually on the 1st of November 1914, the battalion left Tunbridge Wells Station for Southampton and they boarded the SS Maidham and eventually reached La Havre at 7 a.m. on the 2nd of November 1914. On the 27th of November, the battalion was in trenches and it was Noel's first experience of death and of bullets passing close by. His men were suffering badly in the trenches from trench foot over the winter, so he was kept busy in the cold and wet conditions on the Western Front. And, and that was another thing about Noel. He, because he always asked his sisters and his family and, and if they would send him out gloves and socks and warm clothing for his men. He was very conscious of looking after his men and looking after the, the welfare of them. Now, on the 10th of March, the battalion was in the Ypres Salient and he acquired a horse called Doreen and a groom, Sam Moulton. Sam Moulton kept a diary of his time with the battalion. Now this this is, um, there's a couple of photographs that um, I was um, given by Major Ian Riley, but they are, sadly, they are both blurred as you will see. There's Doreen. And his stretcher bearer section. You can see that they're, they're wearing kilt covers. As a, I've got some interesting comments um, about the wearing of kilts by the British Army in the trenches by one of the regimental medical officers. I won't voice them here, but it, uh, it's quite an interesting, um, an interesting uh, thing. So on the 16th of June 1915, the Battle of Bellavarda took place and the objective being was to capture the enemy trenches and high ground between the Menin Road and the railway. And um, if any of you, uh, well, I know um, Ned and, um, and Christopher will know this area very well. 
Uh, but if any of you have been to that, that lovely Hooge Museum there and you walk up the track to the right of it up onto Bellavada Ridge, that's, you know that's the area you are in. The, that area now, um, sadly, is a big amusement park uh, and um, you, all you hear in, in, the, in the summer is screeching children and um, as they go around all the rides there. So um, they were to capture the, the high ground between the Menin Road and the railway. The Liverpool Scots were to advance once the first line had been captured and then they were to pass through the first line and capture the second line. Um, Noel and his 24 stretcher bearers moved up overnight on the 14th and they, and they were instructed to stay behind in the trenches and, and wait for the wounded to be brought back to Noel. He wasn't happy about this. And at 5 a.m., the, the first wounded came down. He tried to move up a communications trench to bring down a wounded officer. But he says it was completely blocked. He couldn't move up there. And he eventually treated 30 men, but found more were lying awaiting treatment. He worked all day and night and eventually managed to bring a lot of these wounded back. At dawn, he found his wounded still waiting further evacuation. He felt the RAMC had failed uh, in their duty to evacuate them. He was always critical of the RAMC and its administration, and that, that would eventually get him into a bit of trouble. So the attack failed. The many wounded occurred because if you look to the right of that image, you can see what looks like a, a flag flying. In fact, it's a screen. So what the advancing troops did is when they reached their first objective, they would hold up a big screen so the artillery spotters could see that they had, they had, they had reached their first objective and then they would lift their fire to the next objective. But this didn't happen. There was too much smoke um, and it obscured these people holding up these screens and in fact, the artillery fire came down on friendly troops as they, as they continued to advance into the enemy trenches. And Noel spent a couple of days there searching and treating wounded with very little rest. The Liverpool Scottish started the attack with 23 officers and 519 other ranks. At the end of the attack, there were 21 officers killed, wounded and missing, 379 other ranks killed, wounding and missing. And when they had a, a roll call, the next roll call, there were just two officers and 140 men unscathed. Now, Noel was recommended for a military cross for his actions on Bellavada Ridge. Recommendations for everybody in the battalion were lost in a fire at Brigade headquarters, so it would not it would be 14th of January 1916 before the award was finally announced and then in June 1916 he received his award from the King. September 1915 the battalion was in the area of Sanctuary Wood and again he was out searching for the wounded and for his actions here he was awarded a mention in dispatches and then in the new year of 1916, the battalion moved back into France and whilst on leave, he developed a friendship with his cousin Gladys. Now, being a Liverpool Scot, uh, a regimental medical officer with Liverpool Scot, he wore the Liverpool Scot Glengarry and the Liverpool Scot badge in his Glengarry. Now, those of you that are um, listening, if you've served as a regimental officer, you'd know today you're allowed to wear a certain amount of regimental accoutrements. Um, but of course, in the First World War, this was a bit strange, or so the military police thought when they saw him wandering around a town in June 1916, and he was promptly arrested because he aroused, they thought, well, He's wearing RMC collar badges and an infantry battalion Glengarry and badge, and this is obviously not right. But eventually, he convinced them that he was actually the regimental medical officer, and um, everything was all right, so they let him go. 
Now, at the start of the Somme offensive in July 16, the Liverpool Scottish were not involved, but at the beginning of August, they moved um, down near to the village of Guillemot, uh, and again, eventually held in reserve. But they, the battalion eventually attacked at 4.20 a.m. on the 9th of August, and they advanced past Troneswood and Arahab Cop somewhere to push on over the frontline trenches and through the village of Guillemont to a position on the eastern boundary of the village. And there, Guillemont, you can see on the right. Um, uh, some of you might have been down there now. This is um, Troneswood from Guillemont Road Cemetery, uh, looking out um, off the back wall of the cemetery. And um, if um, Arrowhead Cops was still there, which it isn't, it would be in a field over to uh, uh, what is um, to the left-hand side of the, of the image. You can walk into the wood, it's, it's not a problem, and um, the cemetery there is quite interesting, has some interesting, um, in, interesting burials in there too. The, the uh, attack failed, the Liverpool Scottish started the attack with um, 20 officers, 600 other ranks, they had um, five officers killed, five officers missing, seven officers wounded, 69 other ranks killed, 27 other ranks missing, and 167 other ranks wounded in action. And he was out again in no man's land, coming out of that wood, across that field, and um, across into our head cops, searching for the wounded, in front of um, in front of Guillemot and was himself wounded. But he did more than just that, as the citation for, for his Victoria Cross would eventually state. He was granted sick leave to recover from his wounds, and by September 1916, the battalion was in Delville Wood, and he records that he worked up to his knees in mud and at one time, he says he had to amputate an arm and evacuate the casualty, which took him over two hours. When the award of his Victoria Cross was announced on the 26th of October 1916, Noel had not forgotten his stretcher bearers and their bravery. Of his 16 stretcher bearers, two were awarded a Distinguished Conduct Medal, so that's second to the Victoria Cross, and two were awarded the Military Medal. The citation for Knowles VC stated, for most conspicuous bravery and devotion to duty, during attack, he tended the wounded in the open all day under heavy fire, frequently in view of the enemy. During the ensuing night, he searched for wounded on the ground in front of the enemy's lines for four hours. Next day, he took one stretcher bearer to the advanced trenches and under heavy shell fire, carried an urgent case for 500 yards into safety, being wounded in the side by a shell splinter during the return journey. The same night, he took a party of 20 volunteers, rescued three wounded men from a shell hole, 36 yards from the enemy's trenches, buried the bodies of two officers and collected many identity discs, although fired on by bombs and machine guns. Although he saved the lives of some 20 wounded men, besides the ordinary cases which passed through his hands, his courage and self-sacrifice were beyond praise. Um, just the, these images that um, I've, I've used a couple of them, these regimental headquarters has, in, in the medal room, has paintings of um, all the VC actions for the Army Medical Services, right from the first one um, in 1854 up to the last one, Eric Harden, in, um, in 1945. And I say they hang on the wall in the, in the medal room. Now, the battalion was back in Ypres salient uh, by the autumn. So the, um, the battalion, they held a dinner at the sh in the chateau at Elver Dinghy. And this is a menu holder they gave to um, Noel to signify the award of his VC and his MC. Um, and um, the, the menu obviously is not the original menu. 
Now, I mentioned earlier that Noel was critical of the REMC and especially the field ambulances. He thought they didn't do a very good job at all. And he was very vocal about it. And at the end of 1916, he was posted to a field ambulance for a short period. And he didn't get on with the REMC officers there. He didn't fit in. His, his main criticisms, as well as the REMC in general, were about venereal disease and he was very scathing that there should be a provision of official brothels. The RAMC officers regarded him as a young upstart. Well I think perhaps wearing a ribbon of a Victoria Cross and a military cross he had the right to be a bit of an upstart. So in the summer of 17 uh, his, his mind turned to marriage, to Gladys, and he wanted to marry her hopefully by the end of the year. But Gladys was impatient and she, her plans were to come out to France and to marry him in France. But the Liverpool Scottish, part of the 55th Division, were training for the battle to come. And at the same time, Noel's younger brother, Aidan, serving with the 17th Battalion of the King's was missing in action near Hooge. But his elder brother, Christopher, his other brother, Christopher, had been awarded a military cross as well. So on the 20th of July, the battalion occupied trenches in front of Welletier, and over the next few days, the battalion would lose men to shelling and mustard gas. And on the 24th of July, they were relieved and went into Derby camp near Poppering. And after four days rest, 25 officers and 475 other ranks of the Liverpool Scottish set off once again for Weltier with the battalion headquarters established in the tunnels below the village. Now also in those tunnels was a dressing station. So there were medical facilities in those tunnels, which was quite important. At zero hour on the 31st of July, the battalion advanced and captured their first objective. And as such, battalion headquarters moved up to Bozer Farm and Noel established his regimental aid post in a captured German dugout. Now, he didn't have to do that. He could have stayed in those tunnels below Waltier, but he decided he wanted to move up and be close to battalion headquarters. Now, if anyone has been there, um, as you come out of the village and head towards the area, on the right hand side, there are two um, very significant German bunkers. And people tend to think that that's the, the ones that he occupied, but they're not. The ones between Bozer Farm and Setke Farm no longer exist. They, they've actually been totally destroyed. So that there's, there's nothing left of them at all. Now, on the 31st of July, he was standing outside his dugout and a, and a shell exploded nearby, causing a head wound. Well, being a German dugout, of course, the entrance is now facing what initially was facing German rear air. It's now facing the German front line. So he suffered a head wound and there's some speculation that it may have caused a fractured skull. He was treated at the advanced dressing station in those tunnels and he was advised that he had to be evacuated to a casualty clearing station. He refused. He felt that if he did become evacuated, there would be a period of time when there would be no regimental medical officer with his battalion. So back he went to his regimental aid post and that night he went out searching for casualties in the front line. Throughout the 1st of August, there was a large gathering of wounded outside his regimental aid post, but he had some help. He got a captured German medical officer to assist him. And over the next 24 hours, he was wounded again, but he refused to be evacuated. But it was at 3 a.m. on the 2nd of August that he was to receive a fatal wound. And as I've said, being a captured German dugout, the entrance faced the enemy and a shell entered the dugout and exploded while he was sitting at a table um, and he was to receive a fatal wound. Mainly the wounds were abdominal wounds. He included a large abdominal wound. He was losing a lot of blood. He crawled out of the dugout um, 
and there's speculation now. Some people say he crawled all the way back to well yeah, to the ADS in the tunnels, but that's not true. We know from records that it was a a nearby regimental uh, medical officer from another battalion that came and treated him for his um, abdominal wounds. He was evacuated um, to the advanced dressing station. Then he began his journey to 32 casualty clearing station at Brandhook. Now, I, I said to you about, just remember that at Brandhook, near the crossroads was Martin Leake's unit. Now, a, a United States Army medical officer attached to 46 field ambulance recorded something that happened. Um, you, you may or may not know that um, the, the Americans didn't enter the war until late 1917. So we asked the Americans to provide us with, initially, they were asked to provide us with a thousand medical officers to come and work in our infantry battalions, work in our field ambulances. Um, I'm not sure if we actually got that number, but we certainly had a lot of American US Army medical officers in our, in our field ambulances and our battalions. And, and this one records that, and I quote, an ambulance came up late tonight, and in it was Captain Chavas, the MO of one of the King's Liverpool battalions of the 55th Division. His face was unrecognisable, all blackened from a shell burst very near, and he seemed to be unconscious. As he had an abdominal wound besides, I did not take him out of the ambulance, which was sent on direct to 32 CCS, where he will probably die. And some of you may know that the survival rate for abdominal wounds in the First World War was very, if you survived to reach a casualty clearing station, the, the chances even then to survive abdominal surgery was very, very slim. What um, they can't figure out is why did the ambulance stop at 46 field ambulance? He had been seen at the field ambulance at Weltier. 46 field ambulance at an ADS on the Menin Road and they had a main dressing station in the prison at Ypres and there was a core main dressing station at Brandhook. So why didn't they just drive him straight on into 36 CCS, which was close by at Brandhook? 36, 32 CCS specialised in abdominal wounds and he was operated on. Surgeons were initially optimistic that he would survive but at 1 p.m. on the 4th of August, he succumbed to his wounds. Katie Luard records his arrival in her book, Unknown Warriors, and, and I quote from her, Yesterday morning, Captain C, VCM Bar, DSO, MC, REMC was brought in. Well, he by then he hadn't got a bar. She must have been writing this later, and he was never awarded a DSO. But she carries on. Badly, badly hit in the tummy and arm and had been going about for two days with a scalp wound till he got this. Half the regiment has been to see him. He is loved by everyone. He was quickly x-rayed and operated on, shrapnel found, holes sewed up, salined and put to bed. He is just on the borderline still. Better this afternoon and perhaps going to do, but not so well tonight. He tries hard to live. He was going to be married. His servant, Private Rudd, in the same CCS after being wounded with him, would also die. And this is um, Rudd's grave just a few rows behind Chavasse's. Noel was buried on the 5th of August in what is now Brandhook New Military Cemetery, number three. Uh, it's, a, it's a lovely little cemetery. As you drive from the coast, you come across it um, on the way into Ypres. Some accounts say that the whole Liverpool Scottish Battalion was present, but this, this has also been disputed. Um, this is his original grave marker in the cemetery. Katie Loard again records the funeral. Captain C died yesterday. Four of us went to his funeral today, a, a lot of MOs, two of them wheeled a stretcher and lowered him. His horse was led in front, then the pipers and masses of kilted officers followed. 
After the blessing, one piper came to the grave's grave side and played a lament. Then his colonel, who particularly loved him, stood and saluted him in his grave. So over the, uh, the uh, ensuing weeks, tributes poured into the bishop about his son, and eventually they held a very big memorial service in Liverpool. But on the 14th of September 1917, the London Gazette announced the award of a bar to his Victoria Cross. And the citation says, His Majesty the King has been graciously pleased to approve of the award of a bar to the Victoria Cross to Captain Noel Godfrey Chavas, VC, MC, late REMC, attached Liverpool Regiment. Though severely wounded early in the action, whilst carrying a wounded soldier to the dressing station, he refused to leave his post, and for two days not only continued to perform his duties, but in addition went out repeatedly under heavy fire to search for and attend to the wounded who was lying out. During these searches, although practically without food during this period, worn with fatigue and faint with his wound, he assisted to carry in a number of badly wounded men over heavy and difficult ground. By his extraordinary energy and inspiring example, he was instrumental in re rescuing many wounded who would have otherwise undoubtedly succumbed under the bad weather conditions. This devoted and gallant officer subsequently died of his wounds. Now, as you'd expect, there are many commemorations and memorials to both these extremely brave men, but Chavas seems to predominate. This is Abercrombie Square. If you remember, I said when they moved, when the bishop moved back to Liverpool, they lived in Abercrombie Square. And this is a statue that commemorates him um, carrying one of his wounded and behind him is one of his stretcher bearers. This was a commemoration that was done at, at a reunion there some years ago. In 1917, I was privileged to speak at um, a commemoration uh, of his death, 100 years of his death, um, and uh, Marie Ellis laid a wreath on behalf of the REMC at his grave. It, it was an in incredible day to be present at. Um, you'll see lots of soldiers there in uniform. That is the Belgian army equivalent of the, um, the postgraduate medical officers course. They, the Belgian army, which we didn't really realize, um, they said they hold Noel Chavas in very high esteem themselves and they commemorate it too. So they brought all their new medical officers down for this service um, held in the cemetery. We initially had various presentations in the old church at Brandhook. It's no longer a church now, and it just sits there empty. And then you see the piper there on the right-hand side, top right-hand side photograph. We were piped across the dual carriageway, a big long position. Um, luckily, the police were there and stopped all the traffic. If any of you have driven down that dual carriageway, you'll know how busy it gets. Um, bottom right photograph, that possession, that the female in the front is the British ambassador to, um, to, Bel to Belgium. Um, what happened to his VC? It ended up in St. Peter's in Oxford, but his military cross was donated by his fiance to the RAMC. But the RAMC felt that it wasn't really correct that this medal group should be split up. So they eventually reunited his medals at Oxford. As you know, they are in the Imperial War Museum, part of the um, Ashcroft collection. Uh, there is um, his grave in, in Brandhook Cemetery. And it's a unique grave because it has two Victoria crosses on its headstone. And um, that memorial to him is just outside that church that I mentioned that we had the uh, all the, the presentations in. So this is um, the, uh, the the Chavas collection in our museum. So there's the there's the menu holder there. There's a pocket watch that was donated to us by the Liverpool Scottish Museum when sadly it closed. A revolver 
um, it's not a service revolver, but that was given to us by the National Army Museum and the original Marquette for that statue that I showed you in Abercrombie Square. So these two doctors, um, their, their exploits, like all our VC holders, have inspired members of the REMC for over 100 years, and I'm sure they will continue to do so. But the, the thing that's wrong with this lecture is it should perhaps be called Three Doctors with Six Victoria Crosses. In the middle there, you can see Assistant Surgeon Manley at the Rebel Pa Turanga in New Zealand um, in uh, 1864. On the left hand side is James Moat. Moat had been awarded a Victoria Cross for um, going into the valley in October 1854 after the charge of the Light Brigade to rescue William Morris. So by 1864, he is, um, he is now a deputy inspector of hospitals in New Zealand. And William McKinnon is a surgeon out there. Um, and they were both in action in front of that rebel par. Now, McKinnon, um, he would eventually become director general of the Army Medical Services from 1889 to 1896, and he died on the 28th of October 1897, and his obituary was published in the British Medical Journal. And in his obituary, it says that he was in action in front of the rebel pa. He um, had to take command when all the combatant officers were, were wounded. And he, um, it was because of him that um, the day was saved. And that he wasn't awarded a VC. He was awarded a Companion of the Bath instead. Now, Moet, reading the British Medical Journal over his breakfast, was not too happy with this. He was a retired Surgeon General by then, and he wrote a letter to the British Medical Journal, and he described the events on the 24th of April 1864 in more detail. And he provided a fascinating extra piece of information. He says both him and McKinnon were there in the gate of the rebel par. Um, they were trying to treat the wounded, but the, um, the rebels are advancing on them. McKinnon picked up a musket and shot one of the rebels. But then um, some of our own forces came to their rescue beat and beat the rebels back and rescued them and all the wounded. And Moet then was summoned to see the general officer commanding. And he was told that um, he was, Moet was going to be awarded a Victoria Cross, as was McKinnon. What did Moet say? Moet said, well, I don't need a Victoria Cross. I've got one already. And McKinnon doesn't want one. He'll have a CB instead for his actions at the Rebel Par. So that's what happened. Moet didn't get a bar to his VC previously awarded, and McKinnon didn't get a VC. He got a CB instead. And little did Moet know by stating that how he could have changed not only the history of the Army Medical Services, but also the Victoria Cross. Thank you very much.